so much. Uh, this is lovely. Gonna, we're going to do a song now. Yes. Oh, thank you very much. I've been sitting here so long For you to hear my song But all you want to know Have I been on the radio? I had a chance of making a living. I could get a shovel and go and walk in the building site. I'd get a paintbrush and go paint and or get a guitar and go and sing. And if I get the job, would I sing on my hands? I never expected anything else other than if I could make enough money to keep me and my family. I'd sing songs of the sun. And when my job was done, I would say I love you so, and I'd like to play one more, just to all young lovers for the road. It's just fantastic to walk at something you love. Tell me, sir, yeah, just how far. To be a star. I used to be in the building trade years ago and I got uh, asbestos about 30, 40 years ago and uh, it takes that long to come out, you know, so it's finally shown itself. We really discovered something was wrong after the tour. We did a great nationwide tour, March, April, of Ireland. It was a fabulous tour, we loved it. Christy enjoyed every single standing ovation, which he never ever expected standing ovation so each standing ovation to him was very precious but every single time before he'd go on stage he, he literally he wasn't able to breathe he wasn't able to sing and, and getting up there doing a two and a half hour performance was quite a miracle so we came off tour and unfortunately he was diagnosed with the illness about five months ago they told me I had, uh, I had three months to live the first few weeks were hard because I, I thought, well, that's the end, like, you know. But then I, I thought, well, it's only the end if I let it be the end. You know, and every day that I'm here, I can make the best of. It's okay to feel angry for a while, I believe. But e even anger can tell on you. So I got angry for a little while and then let go of the anger. Because I don't think that serves much purpose either. But it's good to be a little bit angry for a while, but not to hold on to it. So uh, that's what I do. That's one of the tricks. <laughs> and then I pray a lot. So, you know, to whoever or whatever, you know, I just uh, send up prayers and, and then try and think positive. I always remember a story my mum told me. They, they told my mum she had uh, six months to live. Uh, and uh, they said, we're very sorry, we've got six months to live. And about five years after, she was telling me this, you know, that the doctor told her. But when she left uh, the doctor's surgery, she said, I was really glad I looked at the door and seen doctor. And she said, not God doctor so she said and seeing that it wasn't god that told me that i thought no you can't tell me six months i i, I however long it takes it's going to take that time and so she lived for 12 years after that so i've kind of lived by that since i've been told of uh, that matter you know is that nobody can tell you we're going to die you know nobody knows i have known my highs and lows i've worked in every show I've played in every town And brought some houses down Yet critics never notice me I'm not a star, you see And yet I give my heart To every part We were all just, well, let's just get on with it We've got albums to make, we've got tours And let's see how long we can take this So. You know, for the first few months, Christy was surprising the doctors. He was going on long walks and, and he was singing and, he'd, you know, he'd written this album. I don't know who you're talking to After all I do for you The only thing I thought was that because he'd never drunk, taken a drug, smoked in his life, 
been unhealthy, not eaten well, because he had such a positive outlook on life. I thought there was a chance that he might be able to make a year, a year and a half, two years, that I might be able to kind of get him to that point, or help him get to that point. I was told I wouldn't be able to walk up the stairs, so then I went for a walk every day. And instead of walking for a quarter of a mile, I walk for two, two miles a day now. And I was told I wouldn't sing again, which I've recorded most of the album. <laughs> so, uh, so that's it really, you know, so... <laughs> you can't be back, you know. <laughs> Because when I left school, like, you know, I got a job as a messenger boy. And I, I fell in love with this lovely girl. She was about 40, like, and I was about 12. But, uh, anyway, she was a lovely girl. Born the saddle of my old red hair. Oh, right, should and I without a worry or a care. I'm a messenger boy, bring my love to you. Messenger by bring my love to you. Yeah. When I was about six or seven, Jolly Crack at the end of our road in Kirsten's Avenue, I made a guitar out of a tea chest and he put not not gut or anything on it, but all a bit of string. And I used to go in the pub and sing all these songs and this string used to be flapping up and down. <laughs> I was really good though. <laughs> Everyone said so. <laughs> absolutely hated school, hated everything about it. Hated the teachers, hated the building, hated the idea of learning. I asked my mum if I could leave school when I was 11 and a half and she said, um, when you're 12, you can go. So I told the headmaster, I said, uh, I asked my mum if I could leave school and she said, when I'm 12, I can leave. And uh, it took him a while to recognise me because he hadn't seen me very often. So. <laughs> uh, anyway, he said to me, when you leave school, well, what are you going to do? And as I opened my mouth to tell him, he said to me, shall I tell you what you're going to do? And I said, yes, please. He said, nothing. He said, because when you leave school at 12, there is nothing to do. I felt really sorry for him, you know. There was so much to do, I mean, I couldn't begin to tell him. And he didn't even know at that time I was going to be a star. I was doing the four clubs uh, in the 1972, 1973, and um, uh, just around around this, this constant circle, trying to make a living at that. It's, it, it was hard, and why I kept going, I don't know. And it was like, I was like a bull, you know, just kept hitting the, my head off, off the gate, you know. He'd sort of leave home at six o'clock in the morning and go up ladders and paint and decorate, and he'd come home at sort of four, and he'd get changed, and he'd take his guitar, and he'd go out and he'd gig, and sometimes he wasn't paid, and sometimes he couldn't get home, and he would have to travel on freight trains and I knew he was walking around in the dark on his own and by God he had some stories about those times. I do a folk club with Sam Wales and at the end of the gig you then say is there anybody got a spare floor tonight so I could sleep on and then hopefully there's somebody would come up and say yes and they, they did sometimes and I remember going back to a house one night and they put me into the kitchen they had a blanket on the floor in the kitchen so the husband and wife went off to bed then about four hours later, there was an almighty kick at the, of the kitchen door, and the two of them came in, beat mother on the floor. So I'm lying here, you know. So uh, this is not just unusual, this happens a lot in different respects, you know. And so I packed up my stuff and got my guitar in and, and squeezed out to the door and went out and sat in the station for the night, the railway station. There was lots of nights like that. Christy gave me a bed for the night in 1968. I remember him singing all of these incredible songs to me, you know. I'd never heard anything like this. And the most unusual style of playing the guitar. And his voice was incredible. Mr. Sandman told me, told me in a dream, you were going to leave me. What a funny dream. <laughs> I said, are you doing any gigs around London? And he told me he was working in the building site. I said, what are you working in the building site for? And he said, I do a few bars the weekend. I said, I'll 
Ambrose don't know who looks after us, you know, so I got Ambrose interested in it, and Ambrose got him to make his very first album. I was making a, an album in 1972 for a label called uh, uh, Westwood in West Montgomery in Wales. The first day I put down about seven tracks and uh, he said you need a, a, another song really, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's, there's one more song to go on this album. Yeah. I sat down with the guitar and I come up with this little blues riff. But I'd lay down, bum, bum, but I'd lay down, bum, bum. And just almost from beginning to end, don't forget your shovel if you want to go to work. Don't forget your, it just happened. Don't forget your shovel if you want to go to work. Christie's first album is still one of my favourite albums of all time. A very, very unique album. Christy didn't like me and said, I'm going to record Don't Forget Your Shovel. And he said, make sure you're publishing. So I said, brilliant. So I got a publisher and I published this song. And Christy did a, um, his version of Don't Forget Your Shovel, which is fantastic, I love. And um, got to number one for him. It, it turned my career around. I went from being a folk singer who played in folk clubs uh, to going on to bigger things on the back of that song. Sun shines on my baby Sun shines on my love I met my wife in Water Street in the discotheque. It was about half past eleven and uh, I seen this girl with three or four more girls. So I thought, God, she's lovely, you know. So I went up and I said, uh, would you like to dance, you know? So she looked at me like that, as if I had two heads. And one of the other girls pushed her, you know, and she just kind of came into my arms, and we started dancing, you know. And we, about uh, four o'clock in the morning, she, she went off home, but she gave me her number. And uh, then, um, a few days later, I rang her, and then we went to the pictures, and then I knew that night that I was going to ask her to marry me. I knew, I thought, there is no other girl, this is the one. So we came outside and she said, uh, where, where, where are we? What's that up there, the sign? And I said, that's a sign. And she said, no, what's the name on it? And I said, um, oh, um, she said, you got bad eyes, haven't you? I said, yeah, an early blind girl. So I said, uh, uh, where is it? And so we get up close to it and she, I said, can you not see it? And she said, no, it's really blown. And I said, well, I can't see it either. And for some unknown reason, I think she clocked it. She doesn't think so, but I thought she thinks he, he, he can't read that sign. You know, and uh, then once I told her that, and she said, it doesn't matter, we'll find ways around it, you know. I knew that she was definitely the right one, you know. Because that's a hard call, you know, to go with somebody with uh, no job, no prospects, and can't read and write. Sunshine is my baby. Sunshine is my love. Sunshine is my Sunshine is my love. I'd just like to introduce you to the rest of the band, you know, and um, on the fiddle is my daughter Amber. And, uh, and vocal is, is my other daughter, Hermione. He knew the value of family and the power of it. He dragged me up on stage since I was tiny. You know, he said, you have an extraordinary voice. Um, and this is something we have to do. But it, it gave, I was a foil in a way. I never said anything, really. But he, um, he used me to his full advantage on stage. I think he thought to have a gift and not use it was... Pretty unforgivable, I guess. My children uh, are very, very important. Where her mind is concerned, she's a real strong go-getter and make things happen. You know, and I'm very important to her, I know that. She lets me know that every day. And since I've had this illness, and before, she's, nothing's been too much for her to do for me, you know. And particularly around now, she's just like, she's just gone the helpful letter, you know, making things happen. It's constant, 24 hours a day, she's there for me, you know. He made music so exciting. He taught me chords, three chord tricks, and stuff like that, you know. Um, 
you know, I learned how to play the violin. That was, you know, the first thing. I think I was about four or something, and he was like, what do you want to do? And there was a violin on the wall, and I was like, I want to play that, and that's it. Immediately, he sort of, you know, got lessons for me and stuff like that. And he was like, right, how about the guitar? How about the guitar, you know? And I was rubbish. So he sort of put the guitar down, and then out came a mandolin, and then a harmonica, and then, you know, and he sort of tr try and teach me each of these instruments. Amber is a lot more laid back and soft and very delicate, you know? And I know what she feels for me, you know? Where she's come from, from a, a 10 year, probably 12 years of drugs, and to come from where she was to where she is now is just absolutely amazing. You'd have to look at her and go, this is somebody you could actually put up on a pedestal and say like, I can achieve anything in life. And she's just an amazing little girl, you know? He completely made every day of my life fun. He'd take me out for walks every afternoon and, and if it was raining, he'd go under his jacket and whilst he'd be walking down the street, he'd write songs that you have to join in and sing and he'd do it to the rhythm of the rain and the walking. I've got loads of those things. My dad would write the lyrics to the music that I'd, I'd written and um, I never disagreed with one thing he ever said and anything I kind of had a little bit of a niggling, I thought, oh no, I'm not too sure about that. He, you know, he changed it and he felt exactly the same way about the music. It's just like we've just read each other's minds, we knew what each other was thinking. He's an amazing musician, an amazing writer, fantastic songwriter, uh, a fantastic musician, but nothing is ever, ever too much trouble. No matter if, if I said to him, I can't come into John's, which is a two and a half hour journey, and the record company said they'd pay the minicab to bring me from the house here. And he's up in the morning, no, no, I'll take you because I can play you the records you like. You can have a, a pillar behind you, you can go to sleep, you can, no, no, you come to camp. So he'll drive three hours it took us to get here, and he'll take two and a half hours or three hours back. And then he phones up and says, I'm home, you all right? And I go, yeah, yeah. And he's 22, like, you know. So, and that is constant. My dad was um, my best friend. My soulmate, um, we spent every day in the coffee shop together, talking music and everything else. And then we got back home and, and he was my dad again, and he played a father role. But as soon as we walked out the door in the mornings, he was my mate, he was my best friend. And um, when we went on tour, it was all about music. And then he played, you know, the role of teacher, really. I, I could tell, well of each one of them I could tell this is the kind of character you're going to be and this is the one you're going to be and, this one, and they haven't disappointed me, they, they have grown up to be those, exactly those characters. Oh, the road is longer than I planned for an ordinary man In my life I need a help of bad luck and I, I think there were a hell of a lot of bad luck stories out there in music but I knew I was sitting with somebody who was utterly extraordinary. I watched him go through so much and and so much pain and anguish but in a very gentle way. He was incredibly humble with it. I was on this tour one time in Manchester and one morning I got up and I put a record on the record player and um, started listening to uh, Al Jolson. And for some unknown reason, I started criticising the arrangements. And I just sat there thinking, I always liked Al Johnson and his arrangements are like the best. What's the matter with this one? You know? And I went through this in my head and I was circling around. And then I looked up and it was 12 o'clock. So I'd been there like three hours just trying to arrange this Al Johnson piece of music. I, you know, I don't know if people know, but Al Johnson was dead for years. He wasn't going to change anything. <laughs> So I phoned my wife and I said to her, I'm, I'm, I'm coming home, you know. She said, you know, you're only halfway through the tour. I said, I, I, I can't, for some reason I said, I have to come home. She said, okay. So then I got to train and, and uh, got home and uh, I told her what happened. And I started, like a demented man, going through my collection to get all the Al Johnson albums out. I started playing the, the records and then started arranging them again. So she came out and said, it's half past two. You know, she said, like, 
it's the same song. I said, yeah, but it's the same arrangement. So she said, what the freaking hell are you on about? So I said, no matter how many times I play this, and I've said that that's the wrong arrangement, they're still playing the same arrangement. So I said, right, yeah, okay. They'll probably change it in the morning, now you come to bed. So I went out to bed, and uh, the next day, um, we went to see the doctor, <laughs> and he suggested that I put on this lovely little white jacket <laughs> and go for a walk with him. <laughs> so Jill said, uh, she's going to look after me. There's, I'm not going anywhere. And he's not taking any tablets, she said. I've got to have him at home. So then she spent three months looking after me while I just sat there looking out the window and looking at the record player, dying to play the record. She's put tape around us, like, <laughs> so not playing that. So, uh, but uh, yeah, it was just three months of hell. And then one day I got up and I thought, no, I can go out. I'm going to go out. And she was elated, she was delighted, so I said, you should just try and go for a walk, first of all. I said, no, I'm going to phone my brother. My brother was in England at that time. And I phoned him, I said, where are you working? He said, I'm working on a building site in Victoria. And I said, do you think I could get a job there? He said, yeah, come down tomorrow. And so I went down there, got a train down there, met him there, and started working. I was much happier, the crack was really good, the tea breaks were great. So I stayed there for a while, you know. And then... Um, and after a while, she said to me, you should play the guitar. And I said, yeah, I know I should. But just looking at it was hard, you know. So then I picked it up and started playing it. And I really started to enjoy it and then write songs, a few more songs. And, and then I thought, I'll, I'll give it another go on the old, on the tour thing, you know. In the meantime, um, John Peel had heard my record uh, and um, said to come on the show and do, um, do a few songs for him on his show. So we went along and we did three songs on the John Peel show and it just opened the door. You know, it's like the university stopped ringing, colleges were ringing, did, would you play in the uni tonight, in the uni hall tonight? And, and the money went up, you know, so... But my wife had always told me, she said, if you stay at seven pound, they won't respect you, you know, she said, you should stay at 20 pounds. And it's amazing, because I was charging seven pounds, I used to have to, when I got to the gig, this would be the stage, my guitar would be here, I'd take the guitar, tune it up, walk on the stage and sing, and I'd get my seven pound. I charged them 20 pounds, they found me a room so I could tune up the guitar. All of a sudden I'm, say, I'm doing the same old songs, <laughs> same old jokes, but all of a sudden because I'm charging more money, they've now given me a room of my own, so that I'm like, I'm somebody special. <laughs> Well, I'm enjoying myself anyway. And you're paying for it, thanks very much. <laughs>
vision somehow to try and conform with some notion this business might have about itself. And when the first time you hear Christie's voice, first time I heard his voice, I kind of went, wow, but they'll never go for that because they're, they're too cynical and it's, this, is too, this is too individual and it's too sweet and it's too real. When I was about 43, Ambrose Dinnerhu said, uh, why don't you go out and do a gig in Ireland? Just one gig, please. And uh, Ambrose really believed in me all those years, you know, so uh, I said, but who'd come out and see me, Ambrose? I've never played in Ireland. And he said, well, there's a guy back there, Derek Nally, he'll put you into Whelan's, a place called Whelan's, and he's going to get an audience. I said, uh, you know, I feel really bad for him. I said, turn up and then pay my flight, pay my hotel, and then he's going to give me money. And then I said, are you joking? I said, I couldn't do it. So Derek rang me and he said, uh, look, I'd love you to come over. And he said, that's my responsibility, getting the audience and the money. So a few months later, I went back and got to the Whelan's that night and there was a crowd outside the door. Q. So I thought, Ooh, who else is on here? So anyway, I got in and uh, done the gig. And it was... Um, a fantastic night, full house, audience were brilliant. I think I had a stand ovation. It's amazing. I went to Whelan's and I can quite honestly say that within two or three minutes of Christy being on stage, I just loved him. And I just stayed through for the whole show, met them afterwards, Hermione and uh, Christy, and said, look, I really want to do something. Let's get, let's get working. After that, it really just took off. We did the rehearsal, and the star was on there. D that never came off the radio for months and months, and it went straight into the charts. And after that, I went with Warners and did a, an album called the A Year in the Life. It went to number one for seven weeks, and it was just an amazing time. I walked out on the stage in failure, and it's nerve wracking. And this is a new audience to me, they're all young. Obviously, open air concert. Thank you. Guess I don't feel too bad now. You have a dream when you first start out of playing to people like that, that amount of people, but you never imagine it coming through for you. But it did. And, and it's magic, it's brilliant. It would have been around 1989, 1990, and uh, my sound man at the time, Dan, was telling me all about this amazing singer, songwriter, comedian, because he just would talk about the stories he told on stage and how funny he was, you know. Me, me and my brother, like, you know, we used to put on a show for my mother every Saturday afternoon, like, you know, and uh, she used to just sit on the, on the old chair, like, you know, at the top of the living room, and we used to dress up into different acts and uh, do a song for her, like, you know. And he was my older brother, like, he used to be Elvis, you know, and I used to be Connie Francis. <laughs> I, I didn't mind being Connie Francis singing like her, but dressing up was a bit much, I think. I did my first solo album in 1991. I was still looking around for, you know, songs that I might like to sing. As it ended up, I wrote most of it myself, except for one song. And that one was one of Christie's. 
and it was a song called Jealous Heart. Oh, jealous heart, how you lied. You let me go without a word. I travel far, set new routes. Seeds I've sown and now have grown. Jealous heart. Jealous heart, myself and Kenny Craddock wrote. One evening we were sitting down, we had our fish and chips because we were down in Brighton, so we went down fish and chips, brought him back, sitting there eating our fish and chips, and um, he, he played his track. And um, to me, it just said, Jealous heart. The first word that came into my head when I heard the track being played was Jealous Heart. And I thought, this is going to be a really easy song to write because this is Ireland. This is a song about Ireland. People leave in Ireland and she being jealous of you leaving. Oh, love of life, oh, life of love. Jealous heart. Thank you. The Dalai Lama has been visiting Derry. He's taking part in the celebrations for the 10th anniversary of the local charity, Children in Crossfire. I started Children in Crossfire in 1996 to support projects in Africa and Asia and South America. Probably based on my own experience through being shot and blinded by a rubber bullet as a child. I really want the Christie as a patron for the charity. It's great for the issues that we're involved in, that somebody like him lends his name to us. just driven up to villages that Children Crossfire had been working with and we just got out of the cars or the jeeps and the children just ran towards us. They grabbed beautiful yellow flowers off the trees and then we just thought well, there's no other communication we can do except for singing, singing nursery rhymes, singing songs we knew. The Dalai Lama agreed to come to Derry in July 2007 and we've been planning the thing for a year. So it was a great honour for me and an enormous privilege when myself and the Dalai Lama were standing at the side of the stage and Christy was singing the song that he wrote for Children in Crossfire. Well, once I sang the song, uh, he, he stood at the stage and he was waving, so the audience were there now waving. The day was a very magical day because um, the soldier that shot Richard Moore and blinded him was at the venue as well because Richard Moore had made contact with the soldier a year previously hadn't told us but then said to the audience well actually you know I've got my friend here who's gonna come up and say hello and he's the soldier right and uh, the soldier came up on stage and they embraced and they explained that they had been talking to each other for the past year and Dalai Lama said you know he, he was holding Richard Moore's hand and he said, this man here, he says, my hero. Everywhere he went, he was holding Richard's hand. He did three engagements during the day and the first thing he said in each engagement was, I am so proud to be here with my hero. It was a very moving day for everyone and um, we wrote this song called When Will We Learn? Myself and John Timas had written a song which would really suit Christy and Luca, but getting the two of them together would be bit of a job and a half because they've never sang together before on record. So um, I thought, well, if I don't ask, I don't get you. Know? So I phoned Christy and I said, you wouldn't do a duet with yourself and Lucre and myself, would you? And so I'd love to, absolutely love to sing me the song and I'd have listened to it. I really love the song. I love what it's about. 
Uh, I love the story behind the song. It's a very, very big song on this island because of what it's about. You know, it's, it's about reaching out, it's about forgiveness, it's about love, and uh, I really am so happy to be part of it. I just heard the song and I immediately found myself singing it and uh, loving it, and uh, I couldn't wait for the opportunity to sing with the two Christies. It really worked. It does, isn't it? Yeah. It really does. That's a, that's a good day's work, isn't it? Oh, that's a great day's work, man. There is a link across the water So close and yet so far away When his health started deteriorating rapidly, it became apparent that it might be a good time to bring other people and to bring other artists and to, to really acknowledge what Christy had done. We were in for a, a meeting in Universal with Dave Pinnifeller one day and uh, we said that we had Christy Moore on board and, and he'd done the track. So then um, Dave said, you know, what about a duets album as well as the singles album? What about all your old songs on a duets album and then your new songs on a single album? So in my head, I'm saying, like, that's a great idea, but who's going to want to sing duets with me? So I went through this list, and everyone there suggested I thought, this is not going to happen. But all of them are people I would have loved to ha do duets with. Over the next few months, it started to come back that, oh, Paul Breed is on board, um, uh, Mary Black's on board, Francis on board. Do you think you'll get a chance to do Jealous Heart vocals? Or do uh, I don't think I'd, even if I did, I don't know. Um, Walk you, you say that every day? Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know what you, every day he says, oh, I don't think I can do that one. And then he does two vocals. And, there's four. and then he comes back the next day. Are oh, we going to do that song? Yeah. Oh, I don't think I've seen that. And then he sings it. <laughs> I'm in shock because I didn't think these people would want to do duets with me, you know. But they do. I must be more famous than I thought I was. <laughs> a messenger boy bringing my love. his music back, it's bringing it all back home again almost. Um, and it's great to see everybody coming around and to do duets and be a part of all Christie's work. It was songs like Star that inspired me to be a singer. So the relevance of me being involved in this record was because of that, it's almost a thank you to Christie from me and um, for what he gave me. Hiding away with no fear. But they're never on the mountains or the moon above They're never on the stars of falling in love They never ever realize what they've done Taking someone else's son He was a mind-blowing performer His humor, his banter with the audience Everything about him He brings you into everything he says I remember there was a noise coming out of the monitor on the stage and his exact words, and I thought I'd cripple myself laughing, was, oh, there's a bastard of a mouse in that monitor. <laughs> you never told me jealous heart It's nice to come in to play the banjo and the whistle with him and support his songs, you know. And, um, my eyes out there with the banjo a few minutes ago. Jealous Heart is this piece of music I'm doing, you know, with him. 
beautiful song that he wrote. I remember singing it the original years ago. And to hear him singing it again, it's, it's lovely. Is this the ending to the oldest show? I've played this part so long, my friend. Christy sings his own songs the best because they belong to him. But you can always hear his own voice in the background when, even when you're singing it as well. If love is all they say I take it all the way Let's take it all the way There's a light above you I have never really had an opportunity before to work with Christy and uh, or to show my appreciation in a tangible way for <coughs> for his art. I'd written a song about 22 years ago for my brother who was going in for a singing competition. If, he, if he'd won, it was two weeks in Spain for two people. I had no idea, he had no intention of taking me. So anyway, he said, they love me, absolutely love me. But they hated the song, so I didn't get through. So he blamed me really. So anyway, I'm a great believer in a good song. So if, if it's a good song, I, I, I find it really hard to take criticism on it. Like, you know, uh, I will on more songs, but if I believe in it, I'll do anything to, to keep this baby alive. So I sent it off to uh, uh, lots of different people. I got a song in the post, and um, it was uh, one of Christie's songs. I knew that Francis Black was making an album, and I sent Francis the song as a new song, Terrible Live with Ava. And uh, she, uh, she covered it. And uh, she got to number one with it. It was her first number one, uh, called All the Lies You Told Me. All the lies that you told me, all the tears that I've cried, all the loving you gave me, it was a lie. It just put Francis on the map. It really, really did. And to this day, it's probably the he most heavily requested song in her, in her set. It was the song for me that changed my life in this country. Absolutely changed my life. Don't forget the shoes and socks and the time on. Don't forget your shoes and socks and shirt and tie and all. When I was listening to Don't Forget the Shovel and it Don't automatically the feels that I'm actually playing a Kerry slide almost um, with the tune. And I've tried a few different things with it and um, it's still coming back to this rhythm that's coming through the tune and it's, um, it's quite exciting actually. Tell me, sir, yeah, just how far I need to go. He has a real talent as a producer, uh, anyway, to get you to sing less, but put more heart into the music. Even though Christy makes it look so effortless, he has spent days, weeks, years perfecting his kind of craft, if you like. When I was in the studio today, I kept uh, looking behind at Christy for his approval. Is I'm doing it right? Is that okay? You right, Christy? Yeah, right, Tanya. Yeah. Do you prefer it up high or low? What do you think? I, I love the the sec the, not the last one, but the one before that was lovely. The, Just do you know your opening line, Victoria? What's the opening line, Jan? The Hey, hey Mr. Mr. Blue. Yeah, and um, have we got that? Hey, Mr. Blue. Just, just, uh, just Hey, Mr. Blue. Blue. Hey, Mr. Blue. You, you just need to, to push the top and Hey, Mr. Blue. Okay. You can just hit the top and yeah, after, yeah. Okay, we can do that. Hey, Mr. Blue. To this day, I hear him in my ear going, It's getting there. Yeah, it's getting there. I'd be like, Just tell me, is it good? Is it rubbish? No, it's getting there. Getting over you. Getting over you. Getting over you. Getting over you. There was never a time I believed that I could write a song, and I still don't know how to write a song today. And the problem being is I have really bad dyslexia with the fear of reading and writing. So either the people who can help me to read and write can't help me because they don't understand dyslexia. People who understand dyslexia can't do anything because they don't understand the fear. So I'm in the middle <laughs> at 62 years of age and still can't read and write. So. How have you been able to cover it up, though, for all these years? I mean, you must have gone to some lengths, Christy. 
Um, I, I never really tried to cover it up. Somebody said to me, sign your autograph, and I'd sign it, and I'd be kind of looking at myself, is that nearly right, or is that... And then they'd look at it and go... <laughs> 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 That's the wrong fella. <laughs> All I work is totally on blank tapes and just sit and sing rubbish for hours and hours and hours. And then I wait for inspiration from wherever it comes, but it comes out every time. I just have a plan, and the plan just seems to take place, and over the ten tapes, it just seems to be a little jigsaw that keep building up and building up, and eventually the sound comes out. Writing is an intellectual sort of uh, ec exercise, you know, to try and translate what you're feeling and I mean if you don't have that you know your feelings come out another way and your and your thoughts come out another way and 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 they're all the more individual for that because you're not schooled through a system you know and that's why i think a lot of his songs sound so unusual oh when i go to bed at night everything's all right and mom comes out the light and says good night now I put my head underneath the clothes Dream of the things that I will do when I get old Now I won't need a rocket to go to the moon Cos I'll jump so high that I get there sooner than a rocket I can imagine that Christy would have tackled oh, his illness, whatever you want to call it, um, in a methodical way, because that's his way of thinking. I imagine the tumour being shrunk, you know, however, by this pill hands. <laughs> And some days I might imagine some, some water just flowing through me, washing all the, the, the disease away, you know. I just need to be strong and believe, which I do believe. For my family's sake, I would change their whole life if I started being in misery and, you know what I mean, and, and let this get me down. Eventually they, they'd come down there. So I asked them to just be as normal as they possibly can and forget about this. It's okay for me to deal with this. You don't have to deal with it right now. He's determined to come through this, and uh, we all have him in the white light. It does help to get things into perspective, you know. So I really appreciate everybody around me, and, and the music, and my voice for the first time. I always took my voice for granted. I can sing, and good, I've worked on it. But it's not that, it's a gift. I just realise it's a gift, you know. And now I'm, I thank God for the gift that I've been given to sing, you know. We had a great talk about the beauty of living life in the day, the preciousness of the 24-hour periods that were given. And uh, so I consider that moment to be a great blessing to me in my life, to have met Christy and to be given the opportunity to just share a song with him and to connect with his spirit and his greatness. It's a big deal. Words aren't enough sometimes. I'm going to finish up on this one. It's called um, Roll Back the Clouds. And, and thank you very much. And, uh, it seems like it's written for somebody trying to make it in the music business. And, but it wasn't really. I had. It's everybody really trying to make it in anything that they want to make it in. And if you keep trying hard enough, I'm sure you'll make it eventually. Don't go by me, though. <laughs> A fella called him a legend this morning, walking along the street, and I said, no, I said he wasn't a legend. Christy, I said, it was way beyond a legend. I said, it's bigger than a legend. I said, Christy was an artist. And I said, an artist lives forever. And when your look is all run out, you're asked to take a bow. You've just stolen the show, but now you're on your own. Survive. Yeah, we sing our miles. My dream sing is me to star, me a star. I am a star.